to welcome everybody here today. I know our campus has been under a little bit of chaos. Our country's under a little bit of chaos. And that's, you know, it, it's not helping being at each other's throat. It's, uh, it's time to stick together no matter what. You know, there's a lot of things. Social media is not helping. Um, I'm part to blame on this. I'm just as mad as anybody else about what's going on here. So this is my shot at bringing everybody together. Bringing everybody together. They're speaking solidarity. Well, you're looking at a native that's been oppressed 500 years more. So I'm offering my culture to help everybody's culture come together on this campus. This is a song that was written by Doug James of Quinault. I changed it this year to a heartbeat, and I didn't know why, but I did it the second I got it. And now I know why. Because we all have one, and we all know how to make that beat. And if we can make that beat today as one, then maybe we can get through this cruddy time in American history, at least for this little bit. There's a lot of people that are really mad at people for voting for whoever they voted for. But there's this, this world's bigger than a vote. This, this life is way bigger. Get through it. My good friend Lionel Grant once told me, build a bridge and get over it, bro. <laughs> so I need you people to follow my lead with this beat. I'm going to start this song, but when you hear the heartbeat, please join in. Use your hands and make this heartbeat, please. I'm hoping that this will bring the people together, bring us all together as a you know, maybe a small tribe in this college. Whatever it is. But if this helps, then let's try it. That's all I got to say. <coughs> so please, when you hear the heartbeat, join in with your hands. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming this afternoon. And thank you, John, for gifting us with that song and that heartbeat. And we're here on November the 16th with an attempt to answer the questions that we've been asking as a community for decades. And it's important for us to do this and to start this off in the most appropriate way by honoring the people that came before us and the land that we sit on. And with many tribes connected to this land, it would be disrespectful for us to talk about anything without acknowledging that, and particularly the Medicine Creek tribe whose land this really is. So we're here together for the next hour and a half with the hopes of providing answers or solutions to the issues that we must solve when it comes to serving US students, the ones that are the most underserved now and historically underserved. And the urgency of it, as y'all all know, is unprecedented. And we had signs like that this day could potentially happen. And so the urgency for us to, to act, not, in, not just individually, but institutionally, we have no other choice. So you're going to hear from students, and you're going to hear from faculty and staff and administrators that have been a part of the Equity Council over the last six months that was charged to put together a series of recommendations to make this a better place. Because what we can do, despite what's happening nationally, what we can do is to make this a better place, a more welcoming place, for the people that sit in, the seat, in these seats because that's what you deserve and that's what we owe you. Can we get, oh, sorry, I thought it was the agenda. And we're gonna have this be interactive and have a couple of opportunities for people to engage in exercises with us while still centering the student's experience and centering the people that came before us and the people that we're doing this for. And I'm looking for somebody right now and I can't see them but they're hiding in plain sight. So without further ado. Let me get my little piece of paper. All right, I can't hold this and read it at the same time, so I'm gonna sit it back here. I wrote it on a piece of paper with no lines on it and blue ink. Whew. I'm nervous. Not the nervous full of fear and mistrust. I'm nervous of readiness. The butterflies have fully formed and now we must fly. It takes time to learn how to fly, even if you were born with wings. It's the process. So I'm patient to begin my flight. The process from an egg to a butterfly is weather dependent and also dependent on regional climate. It can take about four weeks 
in the peak of a summer, warm climate. The students are the butterfly in this metaphor. We came to this campus in many stages of our development. Transfer students, fresh out of high school, haven't been to school in 10, 20 years, homeschool, still striving to the fullest, gasping, grasping our identities, owning our power, loving our image and enforcing others to respect us, being unapologetic, still very much in the process. The egg takes five to 10 days, the caterpillar and larvae stage. Pupa and chrysalid each take about 10 to 14 days. That's a difficult, dramatic, eye-opening process of change. Pupa, definition, undergoing transformation. The students have explained to this campus how we need better climate to better enhance our process. The staff and faculty are a part of the weather and regional climate that we need. It is vital that the transformation is customized for each student's process to become a butterfly. Equity, the quality of being, the quality of being fair and impartial, inclusion, the action or state of including or of being included within a group or structure. Changing this campus mindset starts with focusing on the students. The butterflies that we all love to see and watch fly around us, they too went through a process. All butterflies have complete metaphor, metaphoris, sis, number, number S. To grow into an adult, they, grow, they go through four stages, egg, larvae, pupa, and adult. Each stage has a different goal. For instance, caterpillars need to eat a lot, and adults need to reproduce. Thus, each student's needs are, comp are comp um, customized. The Evergreen State College has the capability of achieving student-centeredness with, with an equity mindset. Keep students at the center. And remember, there are approximately 20,000 different species of butterflies. I'll leave you with this. It is not our differences that, avide, that divides us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. When I dare to be powerful, I use my strength in the service of my vision. Then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. Your silence will not protect you. Audrey Lloyd. Thank you. Thank you so much, America. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Felix Braffith, <laughs> and I'm the director of TRIO programs here at the Evergreen State College. In addition, the co-chair of the Equity Council. And I couldn't have done this without the love and support of my equity co-chair, Phyllis Esposito, who has done more than I can put into words. And she's going to come up and, and, and gift us with some thoughts and some words because it takes hard work to have 25, 30 people like this to sit together behind a common goal anywhere but particularly at the Evergreen State College. <laughs> and, as the, and as Shamerica described, it's a process. And, and Phyllis, I couldn't think of a better person to, let it, to describe what it is that we have been a part of. So please, 
I'm going to hand this. Do you want the microphone or are you going to talk without it? Okay. <laughs> As Felix said, my name is Phyllis Esposito, and I had the sheer delight and awful painful at times um, opportunity to co-chair this Equity Council. It is with deep, deep pleasure that I got to sit amongst these people and fight hard for the things that we believe, and we fought hard. We fought hard. But at the end of the day, we came together and we devised a set of recommendations that we all could stand behind. I'm going to have my partner talk a little bit and then I'll talk to you. Yeah, we came together in overwhelming and really stressful amounts of data that was collected throughout surveys and confidential reports and feedback by students. And we've tried to put that in the equity goal, try to address as many of them as we can. And there's still a lot of room for improvement. But we went in there with the vision of delivering and responding to the feedback that we were getting. Oh, my name is Juan Carlos Ruiz Duran. And I am a student here at the Evergreen State College. and. So there's a lot that I can say about this process. I know that when folks looked at that plan, some folks probably said, hey, what about this? This is missing, that's missing. And that's fair to say. But let me tell you what we went through as we sat there and we looked at that data. IR provided us with a wealth of data that told us a complete story of our work here on this campus. And once we looked into that data, we could not divert our gaze. So if you're feeling like, oh, some groups are not represented, I invite you, we invite you to go back and look at that heat map. Because I'll tell you, there were some hot days in Tacoma, not only the temperature, but in the room, as when we looked at that data and we said, this is the lived experiences of our students. It was powerful and meaning. And let me tell you what we did as faculty and staff. We had our heads so deep in that data that we forgot that students were present with us. And what the students that you see here, and here, and here, and there, what they reminded us of is that those, that data was more than numbers. That students were sharing their experiences on this campus. And if nothing else binds us, it is the students. So while we fought very hard for the ways in which we were trying to make sense out of the data and what our next steps were, what united us was that this work is about our students. And so we encourage you to offer feedback, but when you look at that plan, go to that heat map that's been linked, and I dare you to divert your gaze, because you won't be able to do it. This was a hard process. We didn't often always agree. We came close to flipping tables some days. I didn't do it, I just thought it. <laughs> but we hope that when you look at the goals, that you understand and recognize that what we're talking about is a paradigm shift. We do equity well here. I'm sorry, we do diversity well here. I misspoke their name. We do, we do diversity well here. And what we had to come to an understanding about is that we we're moving from a diversity agenda to an equity agenda. And to do that kind of work requires painful conversation and action. The other thing that we realized is that if you look at this council, take a good look at the folks that are here. We got a few people that aren't here. But we have a council that is predominantly people of color. We are acutely aware of that. And so if we want to have change on this campus, it cannot be just the people of color doing the heavy lifting. <laughs> so
so we invite dialogue. We have more work to do. The plan is only partially articulated because you know what? We don't possess that kind of power. That power exists up on our campus, given the structure of our campus. There are things that we recommended that represented our best thinking at the time, that also represented the data that was in front of us. And now we need to say, what's our next step? And we do need to take a next step. Part of the thing that was challenging in all of this is this plan or this charge that we were given was highly complex. Thank you, George, very much. And we had to say, what is going to be a priority? So what we've offered up are recommendations for this academic year. Because we realized that there was more work that we had to do. We had to take 20-something people and try to form a group. Y'all don't know how hard that is. No, I'm not, I'm not kidding. That was painful. Because you know what? On my regular job, I teach in MIT. Everybody here has a regular job. People worked beyond their capacity to do this work. They may not name it, but it needs to be in this room. So when you look at it, you think about all the hard work that went into the recommendations. And then you think about how you're going to enter into that conversation. Because again, this work on this campus and what we say we're about is student-centered. And if we can't be student-centered, then we should take that off our name. Our students are what this work is about. Now, Felix. Mic drop. You've seen the 38 pages. Oh, hopefully, if you haven't seen them, we're going to hand them out to you um, before you leave today. And the 38 pages is just a fraction of what we compiled over our work with, um, on our work together. And the 38 pages are the things that we could agree upon. And so what Phyllis is saying, we're asking for a paradigm shift. We're the Evergreen State College. We do diversity well. We're leading the nation in diversity. But one thing we're not leading the nation in is equity. And what that means is that some of y'all sitting in these seats and some of y'all sitting in these seats have had experiences that ain't been right. The cost is too high. And the implications are too much. And at some point in time, if this campus is going to stand up for what it espouses to be, it needs to say enough is enough. Because if we don't, before we blink, we'll be in just as much shock as we were last week, but wondering what happened to the Evergreen State College. So the person responsible for making that happen it's just joking. <laughs> this is off the cuff. This <laughs> Sorry, George. Our, George is our leader. And truthfully, we're at this point today, it's because he did see the foresight when he came to this campus. And when he went off script on convocation in 2015 and said, we have a problem. We have a problem with racism here on campus. And we have a problem with other folks not being treated the way that they should be treated. And this isn't going to continue on my watch. And what he's done up to this point has put in the strategies for us to provide solutions to the issues that we face. So we know that George cannot do this by himself, but without 
him standing behind us 1,000%, then we would just continue to fight the struggle that we've all been fighting. Not all, some of us have been fighting for hundreds of years. So we submitted this proposal to George a couple of weeks ago, and he responded with his commitment behind Evergreen, focusing on a paradigm shift that places students first, that, that, that places equity as a top priority, and I'm gonna ask him to come up to share with us his thoughts on the proposal and other things that are detrimentally impacting us as a campus and a community based off of what we all should have seen coming across the nation. So George, you're right here. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. Can you all hear me in back? Thank you so much for coming. I am so proud to be here, to be with you today. And before I get into my remarks, Felix, 2,000% and enough is enough. I wanna thank John Smith for your song and I want to thank, with immense gratitude, the council for the work you've invested, the heartbreaking effort you have gone through, and for the incredible plan you have put together. Please let's all give them a round of applause. I have a few minutes of remarks that I want to make that underscore the points that have already been stated, but from my own heart. For many years, Evergreen has, as Felix noted, struggled to find a paradigm of teaching and learning that addresses the many differences in backgrounds, orientations, and life experiences of our students. And when I arrived at Evergreen a year ago, a group of faculty and staff discussing diversity and equity asked me to help improve the college's work on these issues. And as I became involved, I learned about inequities in the experiences of our students that were outrageous. Particularly those, those experiences of our underrepresented and underserved students. And it became very clear to me that a council of faculty, dedicated faculty, staff, and students would be needed to tackle the problems of equity gaps in our students' experiences. And late last spring, I established and charged this equity council, this incredible equity council, with developing a plan for institutional change systemic change that would enable Evergreen to acknowledge and address the equity gaps that are pervasive on our campus. Now these gaps are not unique to Evergreen. They occur in almost every college and university campus in our country. They are pervasive. They are pernicious. And for us here at our home, they're extremely problematic. The gaps reflect a failure by colleges and universities to adopt a student-centered approach to teaching and learning guided by a commitment to equity. And I seriously regret, as our president, the egregious gaps that occur here at Evergreen and our students. And students, on behalf of the college, I apologize to each of you for the ways in which 
you've experienced the effects of these equity gaps. This has happened, it continues to happen, and it must stop. Now the Equity Council has chosen wisely a very ambitious goal for our college. Developing a new paradigm of student learning and success that will, by its very nature, transform how we think about student success and how we invest college resources in ways that advance equity and inclusion. It offers a theory of institutional change, a set of compelling goals, and an incredibly strong framework for improving the learning of all of our students. This matters to me personally. Nearly 30 years ago, when I was a faculty member at the University of Washington, a colleague and I uncovered systematic evidence of institutionalized racism in the court system of Washington State. Astonishing repeated instances in which African-American youth were subjected to racially biased decisions by judges and court personnel. I was shaken by that evidence and angered immensely by what I read. Case file after case file of black youth accused of crimes and how poorly and unfairly our courts were treating them. My intense anger and desire for change drove me to devote years of my career to studying, fighting against, and eliminating racial inequities in our juvenile courts. Ultimately, laws were passed in the 1990s. Progressive reforms were enacted and achieved. And for a moment, it seems for only a moment, racially biased decision-making was drastically reduced in many areas of the state. And yet we all know that racial biases persist and undermine many aspects of our justice system today. And I've come to understand that eliminating bias and inequity anywhere is a lifelong struggle everywhere. Now at Evergreen, some members of the faculty and staff have toiled for years on these issues to reduce inequities experienced by our students and to increase the successes of our underrepresented and underserved students. And just as my colleague and I <clears throat> launched a campaign and a fight against racial bias in our courts, today, we launch a new campaign to fight the systemic causes of inequities at Evergreen. And at the heart of this campaign, at the heart of our effort, is the council's plans, its goals, its goals that place student learning at the center of all of our work. These are goals that aim to substantially improve the experiences of all students while also closing the equity gaps. And I call on all of us, everyone here, everyone in Tacoma, everyone who couldn't be here but is part of the larger Evergreen community, to embrace this campaign, the struggle and the goals. By pursuing these goals, we can remedy equity gaps across the college, increase student successes, and strengthen Evergreen's programs overall. But let me be clear, the council does not propose a one and done project. It enables us to embrace a new way of thinking about our mission, our culture, and our work. And because we seek a culture of learning and teaching at Evergreen that is equity-based and that will always be equity-minded, our work in pursuing these goals will never end. It will be ongoing for the future of the college. Our mission is unique. Evergreen has an abiding commitment to social justice. But how well are we walking the talk? How effectively are we pursuing social justice and equity on our campus, in our programs, 
in our services, in our everyday work and study. Well, we must do better. Inequity anywhere and anytime at Evergreen is a threat to equity everywhere and anytime at Evergreen. It must be eliminated. So we have these ideals that are so important to our culture, beliefs about this college and its mission. They are embodied in the five foci of learning and the six expectations of graduate, of our graduates. But you know what? We don't always live up to our ideals. And for some of us, the message that we don't is very hard to hear and even harder to acknowledge, but we must. For some students, their realities at Evergreen come pretty close to the college's ideals. And they leave us inspired by the learning and growth that they came to enjoy and experience here. For many other students, however, their realities at Evergreen don't even resemble the college's ideals. These students leave us disaffected and disappointed, and they believe we, we the institution, have failed to deliver on our promise and the college's fundamental ideals. This divide in our students' experiences is unacceptable. It is just unacceptable. And without an institution-wide commitment to and creation of a culture of inquiry grounded in equity, we will not close this divide. It isn't going to go away. And some of our students, or perhaps many, will never achieve their dreams of the education we promised them. And now, more than ever, we must deliver on this promise. Our focus today are the great goals articulated and elucidated by the Council, goals that we must and will embrace. However, I would be remiss if I did not state that fully embracing these goals and integrating them into every aspect of our work will require taking concrete steps over many years. The goals can't be achieved overnight or even over the course of a year. The work must become part of all that we do now and in the future. So students, for those of you who are seniors, I appreciate immensely your patience with those of us working day to day to make Evergreen better. To those of you who are first year, first time students, I am confident that if we embrace these goals, today and integrate them fully into the life of our campus, by the time you graduate, you will have witnessed significant systemic changes in our college and our culture. It will become, and you will witness it, a more equitable, supportive, and welcoming campus. Let me end with these notes, and thank you for listening for so patiently. In 1900, African-American race activist and sociologist W.E. Du Bois wrote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The relation of the darker to the lighter races in Asia, in Africa, in America, and the islands of the sea, end quote. It is now 116 years later, and we remain a society sharply divided, not only along what Du Bois referred to as the color line, but as we all know, many other lines. But if we can create a more equitable and just community at Evergreen, our students, you, our students, will be the ones who work to close the divisions in our country and create a more equitable and just society. So friends, the Council's goals and our work together are critical to our students' success and the future of this college. We must engage this work. Therefore, I ask each of us, each of you today, to join the council and me in endorsing and embracing our council's plan for Evergreen and this critical commitment to all of our students. Thank you. Thank you, George.
And we've heard kind of very general um, descriptions of, of, of equity gaps and, and goals. And some folks may have had an opportunity to look over the plan or the proposal. And, and, <clears throat> and when we refer to them, you, you know exactly what we're talking about. But I know that people have schoolwork to do, they have emails to read, they have student crises to attend to, they have all types of things that may have um, not allowed them the opportunity to look through um, the background, the need, and the goals that we have laid out. So what we have done is we have built in an opportunity within this forum to do that necessary work. And the people that are going to lead us through this exercise is going to be Sonia Wheatenhout from MIT and Kennedy Flores, who is a third year student here at the Evergreen State College. Thank you, Sonia and Kennedy. Okay, it's great to see you here. Hi. So, um, as I think about the seriousness of our work, I'm also incredibly excited by it because it's interesting and important and it's, there's so much opportunity in it. And uh, so the purpose of this exercise that we have to do with, that we're doing together right now is to um, use our good minds to seek to understand the goals. Seek to understand the goals and to notice the questions that we have that where um, it would help us to better understand the goals. Um, so that's, that's our work together today. Okay. All right, so here's your task. The first task is that you, is there, am I, okay. Is there a slide? Okay, oh, no. If direction. <laughs> All right, your first task is you're going to get um, the goals. And they are about to come out right now. Yeah. You're going to get the goals and you're going to get the context, the background that helped us in, um, land on these particular goals. You need to know that these goals are informed by um, the literature, by the data that we got from this, learned from the students, by much conversation, these are not arbitrary goals, they are informed goals. And what we want you to do is to read them and make sense of them. This is a sense-making exercise. Read them, make sense of them, and take a moment, you can write on this piece of paper if you have a pen. And we want you to name we want you to think about individually what is important and valuable about these goals. This is about playing the believing game. Name what's important and valuable about these goals. And for the places where you're like, I don't understand, or you have a knee-jerk reaction to question, ask the question, what would help you to understand how we landed on these goals? You need more. Oh, fortunately, people are capable of sharing, right? <laughs> so what, I want to hear from you. What's your first task? Read. And what's your second? What are you reading for? You're seeking understanding, and you're reading for what's valuable and important. Notice your questions. Actually, oh, look at that. What's important and valuable? And then in a moment, I'm going to give you five minutes to, can you make it bigger? It's coming, it's coming. So you're on number one. In a few moments, um, when you've read and you've thought, I want you to think individually. Then you can turn to your neighbor and say, hey, neighbor, here's what I noticed is important and valuable about these goals. And here's something I'd like to understand better. And then you'll have some time to talk, to make sense together. Okay?
voice today. There are many things that we want you to take away as you think about these goals. And, and to understand the nature of the work that we did and the work that's ahead of us. I said this at commencement, and so, but I think it bears repeating. Students of color, LBGTQ community, low-income students, and other marginalized students on this campus are not problems to be solved. We're not asking to be fixed or for you to solve anything for us. We're asking for an equal educational opportunity or equitable opportunities on this campus. Because you know what? Tuitions have been paid. Faculty and staff are here of color. And so let's do and step into this and honor the people that are here. That's one thing. What we're proposing in those goals, like President Bridges was asserting, is that this is not a one-off. There is deep thought that's put behind those goals to invite folks to say, how can we not do business as usual? I have a good friend who's here, and I'm gonna use her analogy because we've done a lot of work um, in terms of institutional change. So Eric, I'm gonna borrow this for a second, okay? To think about what does it mean to be a change agent, for me, and for many of you, it probably has a lot of different kind of um, interpretations or meanings. For me and the work that I've done in K-12 and what I'm doing right now in MIT is that what I want to do is to have a process in order to dismantle the institutional racism and structural racism that exist. What our plan and what our hope is in that goal and the goals we've articulated is part of that process. Because you know what? And I think this is what Raquel said at our last meeting. Our equity goals will not be a destination. We will not ever arrive. But we have to do this work now. One of the things that I said to the council um, as we were in the midst of a rather heated exchange, we were on the Tacoma campus, and I think I was particularly fired up. So I'm going to share this because this is my reason for doing this. James Baldwin, the great novelist, said in an interview when someone asked him, like, why now? And why was he involved in the civil rights movement? And he said, my father waited. My brother waited. My nieces and nephews waited. And he turns to the reporter, because all this time he's not looking at her, and he finally turns to her and he goes, I will wait no more. We can wait no more to do this. So I appreciate President Bridges' comments about this work will take time, but the time is now. These are doable acts. We know that there's more work to be done, and we need many more hands to do this work because we need to share the labor. I cannot speak to the emotional and painful experience of this work has been as a woman of color. I could have chose not to do it, and I could have chose to stay in my silo in MIT. But I chose once I saw the data to say, I cannot look away. We must not look away. So as we think about this plan, we should be thinking about how are we unscrewing the screws, and it will take many hands to do this, to unscrew the structure of institutional racism. We have a beginning to do this. And our hope is that we are inviting you to come along. We're gonna do it. Don't get it twisted. But we would like for you to join us on this road, on this journey. So when you look at the goals and you read through them and you say, where am I and what are they doing? Think about the longer aim of what we're trying to articulate in those goals. 
and to think that if we can engage in a process of saying where are we at and where are our students that we're serving and what do we need to do, then that provides opportunities for learning for all of our students that matches the mission and vision of what we say we're about. Because it is no longer acceptable that our mission and vision only applies to a few. So we invite you. We want more conversation and we know there's much more work to be done. We invite that conversation. But if you want to be an obstructionist, work on your own. Because we don't have time for it. Our group began this journey of putting together the proposals that, that you have just looked at in August of, two, of earlier this year. And what we have done as a council is to intentionally create spaces that challenge the status quo, that, that place people in mindsets that they don't feel comfortable in. The status quo does not feel comfortable in. The dominant culture does not feel comfortable in. So we never had a meeting in a boardroom. We never had a meeting in a conference room. We had them in the classrooms. Because this is a true learning experience for all of us, and it's a lifelong process. And we also made sure that when we did our work, that we did it in places that honored the people that came before us. And the very first day of our retreat, we spent in the longhouse. As we began this journey to striving towards equity here at Evergreen, to honor the work of Mary Hillar and the folks that helped put that building together and to make it a reality that included faculty, staff, students, and bold leadership from atop. We also spent time, days, hot days, in hot rooms in the Evergreen State College Tacoma campus. Because if we are putting forth recommendations to achieve better outcomes for black and brown students, then where else is a better place to do that? while still paying tribute and honoring the hard work and equity work of Dr. Maxine Mims. Thank you, Dr. Mims. And we knew that the journey was not going to be a smooth journey. We knew that we were going to have to battle it out that we were going to have to question whether we were allies or enemies, whether we're for each other or against each other. So we're going to do something for you today that we did as a group in, in August. And we're going to ask for key stakeholders that are on this campus to get on board our journey to equity. So what I'm going to do first is ask, this is the council. Our council is large, expansive, and we're going to, and we're going to get on a canoe, okay? And we're going to get on a canoe that's going to sometimes have fierce waves, unbearable headwinds, and sometimes intentional or unintentional extra rocking of the boat because we're not on the same page or on the same heartbeat. And everybody in the front of this room has committed to that. But we know, like we've expressed earlier, that that commitment has to extend beyond us. And it needs to be displayed to the students so that when they see us veering off course, that they make sure that their voices are heard because 
We don't, if it wasn't for y'all, we wouldn't have nothing. We, we're doing this for y'all. So what I'm going to ask is we need to pretend that there is a canoe going along the bottom of this stage. And what I ask for people to do is to really honor the folks that came before them, that have placed them in this position to do the work that is so necessary. But also, looking into the future to identify the people that they're doing it for. And everybody in this room in front of us did that. But we need to expand it beyond us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for Tina, who is the director of the Longhouse, to frame the rationale and reasoning on where should people enter or board the canoe. Miigwech. Bonjour, Nindawe Magana Doug. Greetings, my relatives. Gudano Kadokwe Indijinakaz. Thank you for the time to be here and to share with you. When I moved here about 25 years ago, I was able to learn something from the Salish peoples of this land. And that was about the concept of wealth. And I would say that we're all wealthy people. Because what I learned was that wealth is not what you personally have, it's, it's what you give away. And what we're doing here is bringing all of our experiences, all of our knowledge, everything that we have, we all have ancestors and we're bringing them with us. And in this place, we're asked to share and to teach with each other. And that's what I love about the vision of our ancestor, Mary Hilaire. Because she said everyone had something to teach and everyone had something to learn. And she envisioned a place on this campus where people could gather together where all cultures would be honored. So the work of our team has been, over these 21 years, to try to continue to bring that dream to reality. So I just want to appreciate how much that we have all been given and that we are culturally wealthy in the Pacific Northwest. And the Salish people of this land, John and James, are here representing themselves and their tribal people and sharing these canoe songs with us. They established this phenomenon called the Tribal Canoe Journey. And it was an intentional action to tell the state of Washington as they celebrated their anniversary, we are still here and we still thrive and we have our culture, we have our people, we have the land, we have the seas. And they established a phenomenon that has grown over time to become an international indigenous phenomenon. And so now you see these beautiful canoes every summer are traveling. And John has created how many canoes out of your studio? 20 canoes. <laughs> and that's pretty amazing. And James carved a, how tall was your totem pole at Quinault? A 70 foot totem pole at the Quinault Indian Nation to welcome everyone. So what an amazing expression of culture. In 2012, my people, which are Anishinaabe people of the Great Lakes area were invited to participate in the journey, and we made a, a wigwasajiman, a birch bark canoe. And in learning about that canoe, we learned some important teachings and that I want to share with you now as we build our canoe, how we think about who will be seated where in this canoe. In our teachings, we want the young ones that represent the future to lead us, and so we ask them to sit in the front. You're the ones that are going to set the pace. Sup? So the rest of us try to keep up with you. But that hopefully we have some wisdom from our lifelong experience that we might sit more toward the back and we're gonna help guide. But we are calling upon the young ones to lead us. And in this work as the Equity Council, that's what we've done. We've said the students are at the center and they are our leaders. So that's just a little bit of how I'd like to frame up how we're gonna approach this travel on our canoe. Let's, un let's unmute it, let's try it. So what I'm gonna do is ask 
for the folks. that are on the Equity Council that have been doing this work for years to identify themselves and to please board the canoe. I'm going to ask folks who are on the council who realize fairly recently how imperative the work of equity is to board the community. We have four or five staff and faculty members that have yet to board the canoe, and four or five students that have yet to board the canoe. But like I said, this work is going to take more than us. And what we need to do is to call people in. And there's very important people that have status and spheres of influence that can either derail and stop this work or put wind behind our sails, our paddles, to help us achieve it. And I'm going to be calling people up. And they're going to make a commitment to you before they board this canoe. The first person I would like to call in to this circle is our provost, Ken Cabot. The next person that I would like to call to board this canoe is our vice president of advancement, Amanda Walker. The next person is our Vice President of Finance and Administration, John Hurley. I would like to acknowledge Wendy Indris, the Vice President of Student Affairs, who is already aboard the canoe. I would like to call up President George Bridges to the circle. So if we can bring this canoe forward some and make sure it's a straight canoe, okay? If we need to have our canoe, and John, let me know if this is not okay, can, there be th can it be three wide? Too wide, okay, so we gotta make this happen, okay? This is our canoe, and we gotta make this happen because we can't leave anyone behind, and we need the right people on this canoe. 
in order to achieve it. And now what we're going to do, oh, hold on one second, hold on. Um, the senior administrators, um, you have to ask for permission and commit some things before boarding the canoe. <laughs> so can we step back out? Can we, can, we, can we get to the side? And I'm gonna ask for a student to set the tone and model for us. What is it that we do before we board this canoe? Who do we honor from our past? Who do we acknowledge for our future? And why is it that you want to get on board. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Camila and on this canoe I bring my ancestors, I bring my parents who brought me to this country from a war-torn country um, and I'm doing this work for my brothers and sisters uh, my blood brothers and sisters and my non blood brothers and sisters that are sitting in this room, whose faces I see, um, and whose face, like, who, who hurt every single day. Um, and um, I, I invite you to come on in this room. So uh, I would like to board the canoe because I'm committed to enhancing and furthering uh, inclusion and equity in our campus community among both students and staff, faculty, and to do that with compassion and kindness. So I'm so I'm doing this for my father who taught here and my son who graduated from here. Um, personally, I am committed to making Evergreen a more student-ready campus. And as provost, I am committing resources to help train our faculty to become be able to promote equity and inclusion in the classroom and outside the classroom. And it's an honor for me to be invited to be with you. Gracias. Me llamo Juan Carlos y vengo de la tierra mexicana. Soy un inmigrante. Llegué aquí 21 años antes y en mi tiempo aquí he conocido que no hay mucha equidad. Entonces yo quiero entrar este este canoe para por mi familia, para mi mamá, mi, mam mi papá, los padres que me dieron vida. And I also want to point out that I've lived here in the United States for 21 years, but I still consider myself an international student regardless of the fact that I'm a citizen here. I'm internationally minded and that's where I see myself, so I count myself amongst that group as well as the main campus. I'm Tom, uh, I'm faculty, and I bring with me the people that helped me begin my own journey uh, about 40 years ago as a student at Evergreen. Um, a teacher, York Wong, uh, Dr. Stone Thomas, and Maxine Mims, although uh, she probably doesn't remember that. But I bring you with me as my inspiration, and 
the wisdom I got from you, and I'm doing this uh, for my students, their children, and their grandchildren. I'm doing this for all of you. This is, this is the reason why I'm here at Evergreen, because I believe that together we can truly build a campus and a society that's more just and equitable. I, this is absolutely the reason why I'm here. And uh, I will work and commit to continuing to work tirelessly with even more fervor to find the resources and allocate the resources to make sure that our students are successful. And I am truly your humble servant, so thank you. My name is Kennedy and I'm boarding this boat with uh, thinking about my family, uh, past, present, and future. I'm committed to this work because it affects me greatly and it affects so many people that I love and it's just, yeah, I don't know. Bonjour. Um, my name is Madeline. Um, and I wasn't going to speak, but I didn't know when to get on the canoe, <laughs> so I ended up standing up there. Um, I'm here, and I came to Evergreen um, because my community told me that there were Native people here working. And uh, I'm here in education because education has historically been used um, to assimilate my ancestors and uh, in my with my ancestors I'm Anishinaabe, Métis, I'm from Kebuek First Nation, I'm from Valdor Métis community and uh, I carry with me the legacy of boarding schools and I carry with me the legacy of adoption, forced adoption and I'm here because I refuse to continue to be assimilated. I refuse. And I refuse to let whiteness consume me. And I'm going to say that word explicitly, whiteness. I refuse. I refuse for my mother. I refuse for her mother, for my grandfather, for my ancestors, for my brothers and sisters, my relatives today. I refuse. And I'm great. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for these privileges today too. So I'm here because of my privileges as well. I'm here because I need to speak up. I need to be loud. I need to use what I have, the powers that are given to me, unjustly and unfairly, to say no more. So I want us to continue. I'm sorry to take the mic for a second. I want us to continue to name whiteness. Okay? And I wanted to con us to continue to name what is really going on. So, miigwech, chi miigwech for letting me be here, for letting me speak before you, for honoring us all with your time. So, miigwech. So I'm here, and it's interesting because um, if anyone noticed what I carried with me on the clipboard, it was not notes. Obviously, I didn't have prepared notes when I was speaking. <laughs> but it was a picture of my father. And I've said this to the group before, I carry his spirit with me. I am because he was. I also am committed for the students that I see in my program because how dare I stand before you and say be a transformative educator if I am not willing to do that work myself. And I stand here with my colleagues who are in the trenches who are doing this hard work 
and who are tired of the load and carrying the load alone. I am committed because I am. I'm here, is this on? I'm here and I commit the position of privilege and power I occupy as the president of this college to invest in this council, its initiatives, and its plans. I'm here because I was told by a high school counselor I wasn't smart enough to go to college. I'm here because my mother said, you're going to college. I'm here because I believe in justice. I believe in remedying inequity, and I will put every ounce of passion into all of my work. I'm here for my children and all the children. I'm here for the students and teachers who've inspired me and continue to inspire and teach me. I commit from my role as Vice President for Student Affairs, my personal time, attention, investment, and heart in this work. And I commit for the people in the student, in the employees in Student Affairs, our time and attention to building our capacity, knowledge, skills, and awareness to do this work. I am boarding this canoe with passion. You can count on me to hold y'all accountable when y'all start to rock this. Tell y'all I cut it off. Seriously. Um, I um, invite every student that identifies as a black person to board this ship physically this canoe physically with me as I board. Thank you. Right now. Let's go. I just want to uh, sort of reaffirm my commitment as a longhouse auntie because we've been here for about 21 years now since the longhouse opened and just want to keep that dream alive that this is a our campus and our longhouse is a place that honors people of all cultures so I just want to continue to be that auntie uh, a welcoming person to all of you but to continue to do the work because it's never been more important and perhaps more difficult. So I'm ready to board the canoe because we all need to stand up and be counted. Watch. Uh, I'm Ty Somerville from the Office of Admissions, Associate Director for Multicultural Recruitment. I bring with me my Tuskegee, Alabama born mother thought it well enough not to give up on a three-month premature kid with 13 different birth defects. A learning disability, speech impediment, and a growth spurt of eight inches in one year, who said to me I had to be the first one to go to college. I bring Every young black boy who was told all he could do was play basketball or football. And because he couldn't read, all he could do was be a janitor work at McDonald's. 
I bring with me every kid who was told their dream was too big. And that the size of the track that we brought them determined their future. I bring with me every ounce of love I received from people who believed that I could do whatever I worked hard for. I bring the spirit of Dr. King, Malcolm X, Mega Everest, Shirley Chisholm, Ida B. Wells, and all my ancestors who made a difference in this world. I will be the last person to board the canoe up in front of us. But we are going to leave this room and we're going to paddle this canoe to the longhouse to finish with our closing song. And I invite everybody in this room to extend their day slightly for equity to join us on that journey to the longhouse. And before I board this canoe, I need to let you know who I bring with me. I bring ancestors from across this globe. From the province of Isabella in the Philippines to the island of St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. To my ancestors that were dropped off in the south and had to find out through all type of complications on who they are. I do this for my 11 sisters and my four brothers. I do this for Dr. Maxine Mims, who I've known since I was seven. And remember the first time that I ever stepped foot on a college campus on the hilltop. I do this for my kids. I do this for the folks that our country wants to get rid of. I do this for Ty that was sitting right there. I do this for Brian Lopez who has to be in hiding. I do this because I have no other choice and I'm willing to give up every ounce of energy that I have to fight for it to happen. So as we leave out this room, I need for you to ask yourself that these same questions and decide whether or not you would like to board this canoe through tough times through sleepless nights, through anything that we encounter, that you commit to be on board this canoe for a better place for the folks that have suffered the most.